This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 575, recorded on November 18th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we are recording at the fourth giant virus meeting in Tegernsee, Germany. I was here for number one. That is episode 261, Giants Among Viruses. And we are back, thanks to Matthias Fischer. And uh, we hope to give you not only a taste of this meeting, but a taste of giant viruses. Now, we're not going to feed them to you, but we are going to tell you why people are so excited about them. And I am really excited to have with me some podcast hosts, some regulars from TWIV, Rich Condit. Hello, Vincent. On the road again. Uh, Except this one is probably the latest podcast we've ever recorded. It's 8 p.m. I know. It's dark outside. Matter of fact, uh, that's part of the weather. It's dark. The weather is dark. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, is it 8 p.m.? Oh, yeah, there it is. Wow. Of course, in the U.S., it's 2 p.m., which is about recording right. time. So. And it's uh, 36 Fahrenheit, 2 Celsius. It was okay. clear today. It was nice. Very Chilly. good. Also joining me here from Tuivo this week in Evolution, Nels LD. Hey, Vincent. Great to be together in vivo again. And I have to say, I can't actually think about a better hybrid scenario here for, our, for your podcasts, where we have the giant viruses, these sort of spectacular examples of evolution. I think actually, if you d- wanted to dust off one of uh, Charles Darwin's old lines, endless virus forms, most beautiful. It's good. It's pretty well. That, that so works. what we're doing. Yeah. yeah, endless virus forms. Okay, we have three guests who are here at the meeting and they do slightly different things. We're going to give you a little taste of what they do. So let me introduce them. First up, uh, she is from two places, apparently. (laughs) Not content to be at one, like the rest of us, with the Monterey Bay Aquarium (laughs) Research Institute, which is in the U.S., and Geomar Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research, which is here in Germany, Alexandra Warden. Welcome. Hi. Good Uh, to be here. Can we call you Alex? Uh, Alex for friends, yeah. Alex, all right, we're not friends, so. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no friends. I feel like this is a friendly room. I've enjoyed the meeting okay. a lot. The so room I'll is go friendly. with Alex. Yeah, the podcast room. is young. The podcast is young. Uh, from, the, <laughs> from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel, Asaf Vardi. Welcome. Nice to be here. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> you don't seem sure. Yeah, uh, I'll find out too. You'll find out too. Okay, did I pronounce your name right? Yeah. Asaf Vardi. Okay. <laughs> And finally, from the University of Tennessee, which, of course, is in the U.S. of A., Stephen Wilhelm. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you, Vincent. You got my name right as well. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much. That's a state where they have good uh, bourbon, right? They have uh, some good bourbon, some good barbecue. They play a little football. Um, We normally have spectacular weather most of the year, too. All All four seasons. Actually, has Florida played Tennessee yet this year? (laughs) Yeah, I think they did. I was out that weekend. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> Can I have to look? I don't up? think you should yeah. admit that. In Tennessee. <laughs> We're rebuilding right now. Oh, okay. So that tells me what happened. So if you like what we do on this and all our other podcasts, we have six now. Uh, you can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute and help us out financially. We do this pretty much on our own, and we'd love you to contribute. More on that later. Uh, Let's start. I'd love to hear, we would love to hear about each of your uh, training. So let's start with you, uh, Alexandra. (laughs) Oh, no. You sound like my dad. He's the only one who calls me Alexandra. (laughs) Yeah, well, usually when your parents call you by your full name, it means you've done something wrong. (laughs) I I think that's been my whole life, right? So, So Alex, where are you from? I'm from Boston, Mm. Massachusetts. And... Where you went to school, high school, and all of that in the area? Public high school, and I have four brothers, mm-hmm. and I'm the second to youngest. Um, and then I majored in history at college. Where did you go to college? 
I went to Wellesley College. Okay. But I did it kind of on the sly because I really wanted to do science, but there was no major at MIT that really fit what I wanted to do. So I did a history degree at Wellesley, and then I did all the science in the world I wanted at MIT. Mm. And I came out with a concentration in Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. But it meant that since I hadn't majored, I could take all those organic mm. chemistry courses and the environmental science courses and lots of things that wouldn't have fit if I'd been a science major. So you, you never planned to be a historian then? No, but I did love it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then uh, after that, what did you do next? So then I worked as a technician at MIT for two years, mm -hmm. and I kept thinking I'm going to go spend a year riding horses somewhere, and it kept not happening, and then I thought, I better just start my PhD. <laughs> so I did. At uh, MIT? At Georgia, at the Institute of Ecology. Okay, jo was that Georgia... Tech. University of Georgia in Athens, and they also have football. They've and also I, played us this year. And, <laughs> and I was appalled by football, and it was just the worst thing because you couldn't find any parking to go to lab on the weekends because there were yeah. big vehicles with people losing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> anyway, um, as a scientist, I uh, yeah never got on that. Bandwagon. So it sounds like you were interested in ecology from the get-go. Yeah, actually, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a naturalist, not knowing that had two meanings. Um, the other one's naturist. My, my, my mother gave me um, uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring when that. I was quite young, and I, I loved that, and yeah. So uh, the reason I was stumbling about Georgia, because you have three choices, at least, right? Georgia Tech, Georgia State, and the university. Of Georgia, which I've well, I'm visited. not going to admit that because I went to the University of Georgia. Yeah, so that's fine. I'm not going to admit there's some other right, possibility. <laughs> okay. And so, this was in the Department of Ecology and Evolution. No, it's it was called the Institute of Ecology, okay. the Odom Institute. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then next, uh, what did you do after Georgia? I went off to a postdoc at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and um, had a first bumpy postdoc, and then moved on to a wonderful second postdoc. Um, both at Scripps? Both at Scripps. My husband was in residency, so there's no possibility to make a major change. Mm -hmm. um, and so found a way, and then I took my first position in Miami. University of Miami? University of Miami. A, Another football school, Yeah, what's right? going on here? Haven't I don't even that. like football. <laughs> <laughs> Not this year. So... Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, I just lost it. Yeah, I'm no. Wait a minute. Uh, so the the where did the it, so it's ocean ecology? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so actually, so the when lab, did that happen? So that happened the summer of freshman year of college. I worked in a lab at MIT of a a woman who discovered the most abundant photosynthetic organism on the planet, and um, I actually didn't enjoy it very much um, because it was a finishing PhD student who said, here's what you do, and left. Mm. And uh, I thought, well, biology is so boring. You just write the stuff down and transfer the cells. And so I switched more to this geochemistry. But after undergrad, I felt I was going to go to chemical oceanography grad school. And I thought, oh, something's not quite right. And I talked to that professor. She said, come work for me. So I did. And that's when I but so I always stayed then with these marine cyanobacteria and then on to the eukaryotes where I am today, why I'm here today. So at the risk of sounding like a virologist, would that be prochlorococcus? You got it, yes. Okay. Wow. That's yeah. good. He's hey, good. Hang He's around. Good. I hang around a lot of different kinds of people, not just virologists. Yeah. So you said Miami was your first position and then next was... And then Marsha McNutt, who was the mm -hmm. first woman uh, editor-in-chief of science and the first woman head of the National Academy, before she became those things, called me from Mbari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research mm -hmm. Institute, where she was director, and asked if I would be interested in a position there. And you said, yeah. I said, I'll look. <laughs> <laughs> How many years was that after my... Actually, my only year? three. Okay. But my husband had done this... He's... German, and he had been at Harvard and then UCSD for residency, and 
moved to a private hospital in Miami and had had no idea what that means mm. after being in this academic world. Mm. And I saw even less of him than in residency. And <clears throat> so it seemed like we needed to look for another possibility for, for him, and, and it was a good possibility for me. When was Ambari established? Ambari, I should know the answer to that. Um, it's, Long time ago? No, 25 to 30 years. I really, he, David Packard said, we want to study the deep ocean. We can make technology to do this. Mm. And he started this amazing institute with engineering and science in one place. How many, uh, I mean, how many staff there? It's just, it's 12 PIs and 200, about 200 total. But a lot of that is in ship operations. Mm. Wow. And how's it funded? Uh, the Packard Foundation, and then all the normal DOE and NSF and all the This is Packard like my scintillation counter? Packard like Hewlett Packard. Like Hewlett Packard, okay. You still have a scintillation counter? No, it's dead. I mean, nobody, does anybody here know what a scintillation counter is? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, hey, a lot wow. of people, But Bunch only on this side people. of the room. <laughs> <laughs> the old people. <laughs> not all old, not all old. Um, so, you know, some people do work in two places far away, like I know a guy that works in Madison and Tokyo, and you never thought of doing that. You don't want to do that. I have kids. Yeah. Yeah. So is there much connection with the aquarium as a tourist? I think of the Monterey Bay Aquarium as just a magical place. It's an amazing place that Julie Packard, David Packard's son, uh, daughter, founded. And um, she really had this idea of an aquarium that's about conservation, not yeah. just about showing off animals in tiny cages or tanks. Um, and it's just such an incredible place. Uh, and Bari is focused on research and, and very specifically sort of stayed out of the fisheries kind of area in order to alleviate some of the tensions in the area over that kind of thing. Asaf, where are you from? I'm from Israel. By the way, is that your beer there? Yeah. He's pretending it's mine. <laughs> yeah, I see. You push it. You can, it's okay. You can drink it. <laughs> After I finish the water. Yeah, no problem. Maybe you should drink it now. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll, drink, I'll drink to that. So. <laughs> born and raised in Israel. Yeah. And, we're, and you went to early schooling there as well, I presume? Yeah. College too? Yeah, I was born in Haifa. That's by the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah. Beach boy in Haifa, regular beach boy in Haifa. Uh, <laughs> so passion for the sea, for sure. And then uh, I did all my studies, uh, undergrad and grad in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, then went to in, in molecular ecology, um, study Lake Kinneret, which is the Sea of Galilee. You all know it for different reasons. Um, <laughs> You bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then moved on uh, to the first postdoc with uh, Chris Barler and the Col Normal Supérieur uh, in Paris mm -hmm. to study uh, algal genomics. This was just when the first genomes appeared, uh, and the atom genomes, um, and to study, which is a lot of the passion of what we have in the lab, study cell-cell communication, cell signaling, chemical ecology. Uh, then moved on to a second postdoc at Rutgers University. Uh, Who was that with? Kay Beidel and Paul Falkowski. Oh, okay. So Kay was on a recent TWIV. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, Paul was there. As he, he showed up with stitches on his head. With dreadlocks and the with whole dreadlocks, thing. yeah, but the stitches uh, got me. And he said he was surfing, and he said that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not, I'm, okay. I don't do surfing, I do open uh, water swimming okay. in the ocean. Nice. Well, Swam yesterday. How far? Um, three kilometers oh, wow. to five. Wow. wow. That's why you missed my talk? Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, late flight. But meanwhile, on the way to the airport. <laughs> on the way to the airport. Um, <laughs> Seriously. That's about the worst excuse <laughs> I've ever heard, but okay. <laughs> and a one-year-old baby. At home. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah. I'll go for that one. So how long were you at Rutgers? A couple of years? Yeah, three years. Okay. Lived in uh, New York. Uh, my wife is an amazing artist. Mm -hmm. um, often does a lot to do with art and science and microbiology and so on. Yeah, she, does. she just had a three-month uh, big show in uh, 
museum in Israel on uh, it's called the Mariana Trench. Mm -hmm. This uh, woman that mapped the <coughs> this oceanographer that mapped the ocean floor uh, and was not allowed to go with the Alvin mm -hmm. down there, and just by uh, codes and rudders uh, was able to do so. Uh, it's amazing installation. Uh, cool. Yeah, Does so we ever, collaborate a lot. Yeah. Does she ever draw your organisms? Oh yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. We need a um, show, show image. Of, I, uh, a piece of her work. Yeah. Can share some animation. That'd be great. Cool. Yeah. She did books, animations. Um, we we even have uh, unpublished uh, children's book. Mm -hmm. yeah. With a microbial connection as well. Yeah. Or, yeah. Wow. With blooms and uh, so instead of looking for Nemo. <laughs> or looking for <laughs> <a> nano. <laughs> um, yeah. Why don't you publish it? And it's actually in like 10 languages and so on, but um, why? Um, we need uh, someone uh, to push it forward. <laughs> so the, the Everything is ready, illustrations. Yeah. And so the reason I ask is I have a colleague in Mexico, Susana Lopez. Mm -hmm. She got a L'Oreal Prize a number of years ago and used the money to publish a book on vaccines. It's called Paul Has Measles, children's book, mm -hmm. and she gives it away. But it's also 15 different languages. When she put the first one out, uh, everyone started emailing and saying, can I do it in my language? And so, and it's free download. Sorry. So you should, you should, Paul Has Measles. Your kids might like it. <coughs> uh, apparently a lot of scientists bring it to school and they teach with it and the kids love it. And one of the, one of the I'll get back to ecology in a minute. <laughs> One of the <laughs> cool parts Part is that at the end of the book, so Paul has measles and he comes back and then the teachers say to the kids, have your parents write a list of all the vaccines you've had and they all bring it in the next day and they all discuss it. And so now parents go to, their, to school and they read it to the kids and then the kids write lists of the vaccines that they had. It's very cool. Mm. It's, so you should do it with your book. It's worth doing. <clears throat> They're not it's, from Santa Cruz, where 22% aren't vaccinated. Oh, man. S Santa Cruz is 22%? Well, at, at the Montessori, anyway. Oh, yeah. wow. Oh, man. That's a lot. Well, you know, parts of Texas is 50%, we learned. Certain counties in Texas. That yeah. just gives me the creeps. All right, me too. Mm. Yeah. Whooping cough. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, back to Rutgers. You went After Rutgers, what did you do next? So I moved back to Israel. Back home, yeah, in 2010. That was to the Weizmann. Yeah. And how long have you been there now? <laughs> ten years. Okay. Almost ten years. So you too have a long-standing interest in marine organisms, ecology, yeah, mar marine uh, ecology, marine microbiology. Okay. Microbial ecology. Yeah. So so far, both of them had said ecology, the E word, you know. Yeah. So let's see our third guest if he says it. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve, where are you from? Uh, I'm a Canadian. So I'm from Ontario. I'm from a Little hamlet called Shakespeare, mm -hmm. small farming town, population 800, grew up on a 100-acre farm outside town, uh, went to elementary school in a small town of 800, high school in the city of Stratford, um, and then went to the University of Western Ontario for undergraduate and graduate work. So, yeah, there was a picture on your website of somebody standing in front of a tractor Pulling a bunch of hay. Was that you? <laughs> that was my grandfather. Okay. <laughs> so I think when we had ASV in Western, you came and I think you said, I'm yeah. from here and I grew up around here, right? Yeah, that was, that was kind of special. Um, that's, that's where when Nelson and I first met as yeah. well. Um, that talk, ASV at Western, was 20 years to the week from when I walked across the stage to get my PhD on, on that stage. <laughs> wow. Cool. Very so cool. that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Also a special meeting for me. So that's when uh, Vincent asked me at uh, late night at a bar if I'd be interested in starting a podcast on evolution. And I was in a few drinks in and agreed to it pretty <laughs> uh, quickly. And then uh, had my bluff called a couple weeks later. And we now are in the fifth season of Twivo. Uh, episode 49 will be the next one we record. So the moral is, don't buy me drinks. Because <laughs> <laughs> you might get asked to do a podcast. Might end up doing a podcast. Yeah, be careful what you wish for. I have ideas for others, but I do need people to do them, yeah. Well, Nails at that meeting had one, a, a Palmenberg investigator. So I was introducing him, and he, he pulls his phone out, and he starts fumbling with it. I'm like, 
what are you doing? We have 2,000 people. He was taking a selfie of us, right? Well, that's kind of, that's, <laughs> guilty as charged. Right that on was, the uh, podium there. It was, that's oh, it's a good idea. Of, well, it's kind of early days of selfies. Now it's yes. not so unregular. No, it was to good. Do, yeah. It was good. Okay, uh, back to uh, Steve. Uh, so you grew up uh, in, in Ontario and then you went to school and all that. And where'd you go to college? Uh, well, I went to the University of Western Ontario, Western, okay. um, which is now Western University. So right. uh, my university technically doesn't exist anymore. It's changed names. Um, I did an undergraduate degree in genetics. Mm -hmm. um, and then I stayed there for a PhD. I switched into a plant sciences department. That department doesn't exist anymore. So that kind of <laughs> says something about my education. Um, but I was lucky enough that I was at the time very interested in corn and agricultural crops. And uh, a, a professor with a lot of insights steered me away from that towards cyanobacteria, um, arguing that you could do as much in a week with cyanobacteria um, as you could in a year with corn, because that's how long your seasons were. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, I started working on cyanobacteria, using chemostats to grow them, and asking questions about biogeochemistry um, and, and the ecology of cyanobacteria. Ecology, you there said, it is. Said it. The E word. Okay. Matthias, you said this was going to be ecology driven. There, there you go. Uh, that was a uh, PhD, you said? It was my PhD, yeah. Um, so I finished up there, and then I was lucky enough that uh, a scientist in Texas named Curtis Suttle was looking for uh, a technician at the time. And I applied for the technician jobs because there wasn't any postdocs that year. Um, but Curtis brought me in, let me come in as a postdoc. And much of that is, is history now. I spent a mm -hmm. uh, year and a half in Texas with Curtis. Then he moved the lab to the University of British Columbia. And he kept me around because I can lift heavy things, <laughs> <laughs> like most of his lab equipment. Um, and then we moved to Vancouver. And so I spent another almost year and a half in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So my postdoc was kind of split between yeah. two places. So was that in Austin? Uh, that was in Port Aransas, so down on the coast. Ah, it's UT okay. Austin, but they have a marine lab down on the coast. Okay. So another small town scenario. So you got into marine ecology through the cyanobacteria? I became interested in marine stuff through the cyanobacteria, but really started to learn seagoing oceanography uh, when I had the opportunity to work with Curtis. Okay. And what got you onto Curtis's group? Um, I'm not sure I want to know the answer to that since Curtis is sitting in the room. Well, I mean, um, maybe there was only one applicant. Yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, how did you get onto it? How did you choose, or how, why were you I interested had, in his? I group? had met Curtis at a meeting, mm -hmm. uh, American Society of Limnology and Oceanography, it was called then, ASLO. And I had seen him talk, and I had met him, um, and was just really impressed. And so when he advertised for this job, I thought, this is worth moving halfway across the continent. Yeah, cool. Actually, Curtis has been on TWIV. You remember? Montreal. Montreal, yeah. Anybody else here? I know at least two people. Jim. 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 Van Etten. Jean Michel. Jean Michel. Eugene. 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 Yep. Uh, Chantal, we say that. Anybody else I'm missing? You don't get any prizes or anything. <laughs> I'm just curious. Okay. No t shirts, no nothing. No, no. nothing. We ran out of t shirts for the year. What? I'm, I was here. Yeah, we were totally <laughs> promised t shirts. We're ready for the t shirts. I'll mail them to you. Okay. Coffee mug. You all heard that. Yeah, we have a world tour t shirt from last year. We went so many places that we had a rock, you know, a rock star t shirt with all the places on the back, and uh, I ran out. But we'll make one for 2019, so this meeting will be on it. And now I'll send you all one. What, what size do you need? Large? Um, maybe extra large. <laughs> large. Small, right? I don't know. Something. <laughs> I'm sorry. So what we did is we picked three of each of your papers. So wait a minute. Yeah, what, what do you want to do now? I think we only got as far as UBC. Is that right? Yeah, we still have some ground to cover with Steve. Oh, you told me. Well, no, you're right. You, you're right. So I applied for and received a Nation, Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada Award to be a visiting scientist in a government lab. And I went and worked in Burlington, Ontario, Environment Canada Labs there. And I transitioned to that point from doing ocean stuff to lake stuff for a year. Um, and then it was during that time there that I um, had a couple of job offers, and I, for some reason, chose the University of Tennessee. That was 1998 when I moved in there. Tennessee's not real near the ocean. Tennessee is near a very old ocean. <laughs> okay. Um, but as, as I point out to a lot of colleagues, I have many friends on the east coast of the U.S. that work in the Pacific, 
and many yeah. friends on the West Coast that work in the Atlantic, hmm. most of it starts with a long car ride or a plane ride for everybody. Right. Okay. And this is in Knoxville? This is in Knoxville, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what department in Knoxville? Department of Microbiology. Do you know Barry Rouse? I know Barry Rouse know. very well. <laughs> yeah, we used to know Barry. Is, is he still working? Or He's still active, still okay. has a couple of NIH nice. grants and mice and um, works on herpes. Yeah, we, we have a, a large number of microbial ecologists in my department. That's one of our claims to fame. Uh -huh. We have, you know, my, most micro departments have one or two. We have about seven or eight. So about half our department is, does ecology. So from that point of view, is a pretty good fit, a good- It's, good it's a great fit, okay. yeah. It's, uh, and it's a very young department, so I might be okay. the oldest person in there. How long have you it. been there? Uh, 1998, so 21 years. Okay. So Barry Rouse, some of you know Barry Rouse. He um, we used to work on herpes simplex or herpes viruses, and he used to get up and give a talk. So I remember once there was a talk on LCMV, right, a mouse virus that you used to study immunology. And then he got up and he said, okay, now we're going to hear about a virus that actually makes people sick. But for this audience, that's no good because not, <laughs> none of you work on that. But I thought that was pretty cheeky, don't you think? Okay. One, uh, we, took, we picked one of uh, each of your papers and we want to talk about it today. Okay. And we'll start with you, Alex. Uh, you published this. Oh, I got to Alex. Yeah. <laughs> Already. Because it's good, uh, right? It's good. It's good. I can go back to Alexandra. <laughs> Although here, I've, everyone called you Alex, so that's fine. So the wonderful PNAS paper, Distinct Lineage of Giant Viruses, uh, brings a rhodopsin photosystem to unicellular marine predators. So let's talk about that. Remember, our listeners are pretty uh, broad in terms of their science background. So you say early on in the paper that not many giant viruses have been actually isolated, which means getting infectious virus from the oceans. Correct. I think Matthias is one of the first. Uh, well, EHV, I guess, is a very early one, a, a, an algal virus. And then Matthias has a very special one. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, but there really are very few of these giant viruses where we know the actual host mm -hmm. um, in the surface ocean. Uh, let's, before we get too far into this, for the twiv crowd out there define what a what a giant virus is now look at me so these are <laughs> these are viruses with genomes that well the the cutoff will, will vary by a person but above 300 kilobases in genome size i guess is some people move it to 500 now some people mm -hmm. shift it around um in the case of this virus we isolated it's about a 900 Kilobase genome, so it's getting towards the size of, of small bacteria. So these are double-stranded DNA-containing viruses. Mm -hmm. Okay, I used to, uh, and they all have, uh, there's a whole world of them out there now, yes. right? With, uh, but all related to some extent. Well, I mean, there's this common core of, uh, of genes, right, conserved uh, throughout the lineage. You're looking skeptical. Well, <laughs> yes, in there, there, you know? there is a common core of genes, yes. Okay. But, you know, we're, we, you and I are also related to some fungi out there. So. Okay. I'm, I'm related. I, I'm okay with that, but some people sort of take offense when you call them a fungus. So. It's so. funny at this meeting, sorry, uh, one minute. Yeah. I've heard people say my virus used to be the biggest last week or a year ago, but not anymore. It's very amusing. Yeah, you know fast-moving field. And the um, acronym we're, we're hearing thrown around a lot is this NCLDV. What is, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you guys just use those five letters? And... It stands for nucleocytoplasmic large DNA virus. And this is, but we're talking about a massive swath of diversity here. And where even Rich Condit might be considered a giant virologist, I guess. And so. Well, you know, I'm only 200 KB, so <laughs> I, I missed the cutoff. Yeah, he missed the cutoff. Right? I used to say that, uh, well, you know, early on when I gave a seminar, I said poxes are the largest DNA viruses uh, in the known universe. And then the known universe changed. Yeah. I bet you didn't say known. No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't think so. But now you learned. Right? Jim Pippis taught me that. To, yeah, to say no. So you used uh, a special approach 
to try and get an infectious virus. Tell us about that. Yeah, so when I started my lab, I really wanted to, to look at interactions between different biological entities in the sea. And I was really focused on algae. And, and then we sort of got stuck in this place where we didn't even have genomes of the algae and we couldn't culture most of the algae. So we, we spent a whole bunch of years just working hard on, on getting some algal genomes and understanding some of these uncultured groups and discovering some new photosynthetic groups. And, and in the meantime, we kept sorting away with this instrument where we can pass the cells by single file and pick them out for certain characteristics. And, uh, and we learned a lot about evolution of algae using that method. Um, and then we worked um, quite hard to get at interactions. And th we had a, a grant with, it was with three other PIs, lovely people who I've really enjoyed working with. And, and it was on interactions like, you know, algae with bacteria and protists, predatory protists with bacteria. And we spent lots of time sequencing away and getting lots of information on that. <clears throat> and we had a couple spots where the data just didn't come out looking very good. And we thought, okay, well, that single cell sort of went awry. And then I had this really talented postdoc join the lab. And he sort of dug through all our old data. His name is David Needham. And, um, and he said, you know, I see all these cool things in these ones that people said were garbage. <laughs> and there were the giant viruses. Wow. Mm. So this, and it, you mentioned this in your talk here. You carry these cell sorters on ships. Yes. So these this. are, you know, typically run in a m sort of sterile medical setting, mm. and uh, they're technologically pretty advanced, and they require being in a room with thermal stability, air conditioning, and we crane them onto a rusty iron bucket mm. and uh, and run them at sea. Mm. That's pretty brave. They're th they're very expensive, right? They are about eight hundred thousand. In fact, sort of my whole beginning of my lab was, you know, hanging over the ocean, about $800,000. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you, you, you recover water samples from the ocean, then you put them through the single cell Correct. sorter. Is that how it works? Yes. And then you put single cells into wells and... Yeah. And we've developed different markers to try to look at different cellular characteristics that we can apply in the field. And, and I've been lucky to have wonderful folks in the lab who, who withstand the sort of Really, the, the woman who's behind some of these recent sorts, she'll, mm. um, she's extremely committed, does a beautiful job, even though she's running outside to sometimes lose her lunch. Mm. Um, but she's, she's amazing in what she can pull off, even under rough sea conditions. So it's, it's interesting that you, you relayed this development to us, but in the paper, it sounds like it was all planned out, right? We sorted cells mm. and we got nine or something and we sequenced the genome. It's true, yes. And I mean, certainly after we got very targeted about it now yeah. and, and now we, we really focus on that. But yeah, you can't necessarily, I know of one person who's, who started a paper actually in cell with the words, we serendipitously found, um, but I wasn't brave enough to, to do that. <laughs> yeah, most, we think most of them are like that, right? But then you rearrange the order because it yeah. sounds better, right? So what was the organism that yielded this uh, virus? Oh, the organism is wonderful. It's a coanoflagellate. And so coanoflagellates are um, the closest unicellular living relative of, of animal. Mm -hmm. and, and they're amazing because they have a unicellular state and a truly multicellular state, and they can transition between those. So really, the place they're studied most, I think, <coughs> is in trying to understand um, the evolution of multicellularity in the animal lineage. Mm -hmm. And we've known they're in the ocean for a long time, but sort of people thought a bit marginal. And, um, and I think part of that is the bias of some of these modern sequencing methods where there's all these issues with copy numbers and, and, and someone will say this organism is really important because we see a lot of its sequences. Um, but when you actually go and target mm -hmm. actively feeding cells, you see that someone else is really important, and it's the coanoflagellates. So and now, just a, yeah, just a quick note that's on coanoflagellates. Yeah. So we uh, on Twivo uh, have been pretty enamored by that idea of that sort of uh, branch point to the last common ancestors Nicole with King. animals. Uh, a lot of Nicole King's work. So actually, when we saw your uh, viruses, it was immediately really excited. Since in a, uh, the last Twivo episode, number forty-eight, I think we looked at a paper. Uh, talking about this uh, newly discovered coanoflagellate that has this really... We were there when they discovered the it. Same, we yeah. were 
in Curacao when they saw this crazy thing going on. Mm. And, and of course, it distracted them from the sorts we had done for them. We, we sorted all these koanos for them. But then all of a sudden, there was a cooler, newer koano. So you were working together. <laughs> Was yes, that by we chance went, or was no, that? No, that was, was by a, design. Yeah. And, and through this project led by a guy named Patrick Killing at UBC mm -hmm. um, he, who's, and Forest Rower, who have really put together this idea of meetings in the field. Yeah. So well, well, I'll let you get to the um, cool connection there with the light sensitivity or some of the uh, molecules that came up. But we also talked to Nicole King on an early episode of Tuivo. Mm -hmm. I don't have the exact number at my fingertips, but we can put the link to that and hear her story about how she picked that. It's kind of a really cool collision, I would say, between bringing that forward as a model system for thinking about evolutionary ideas and then the ocean ecology that you're coming at with the giant viruses. Yeah, and what's great is Nicole is now hooked on field work. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So this, organism's li uh, this organism lives just in the ocean or is it all over the place? They're in uh, lots of saline places. Okay. So um, I think Nicole, so Curacao, it, it's an island in the Caribbean just off the coast of Venezuela, and it has these very high salinity ponds and all kinds of mangroves and other places where you can find koanos. But where we've been most surprised to see them is out in the open ocean um, because the dogma was they didn't matter there. And I think it's an, an, an artifact of the methods where maybe their structures were being stripped off and they were being called, what is it? Heterotrophic nanoflagellates, uh, which is a name for saying, I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and I think that a lot of the methods may have been so brutal that, that we lost the structures that make it classically known as a quinoflagellate. So from one of these single cell sequences, you got a, f a full viral genome. Yes. So tell us a little bit about so I, that. You know, I think we walked through lots of, you know, how do we interpret this data? Was it something that was eaten or, um, right. you know, and we, we've walked through all of those in detail in the paper, but you know, one of the things that's amazing about it, we got this beautiful genome. And I think because we weren't working, we were working with a single eukaryote, but we weren't working with a single virus. Mm -hmm. That virus had, uh, really gotten going inside that cell. And so we had many templates when we went to sequence this single thing. What's the, what's the genome size again? It, it's right around 900 KB. 900 KB. And, it's 800. and we have a new one that's bigger, 1.6 <laughs> from <laughs> megabases. It's another coanovirus? It's another coanovirus. Okay. And I think for the first one, you had 862 open reading frames. Correct. And half wow, of those... Good. Half of those... You'd never seen before, right? Yes, and this is, I think, typical of what we've yeah. been hearing about it at this meeting, that there's just this phenomenal amount of biological diversity out there, proteins that we know nothing about. Right. So in the paper, you talk about having to get another one, and in your talk, you, you spun it differently, which is really interesting. But uh, you had a specific way to go after a related virus, right? Yes, yeah, so we so one of the unique things about this virus, well, unique, there's there's always another case, Matthias's Crow V, um, but it has 22% GC content. And so by going old school, we could do um, a density gradient and ultra centrifugation and separate out the low GC material in a in a very traditionally collected DNA sample where you filter down lots of seawater. Typically, when you filter down lots of seawater and extract the DNA and sequence, you can't assemble the eukaryotic genomes and you can't assemble the giant viral genomes because there's just too much diversity there and the, they're too low in abundance. Mm. Um, but by sort of zooming in then on this lower GC fraction, we could get rid of all that other garbage that we weren't interested in and, and get the virus again. So it was a second one related, but not... Very the, closely related. Yeah. Very closely, same yeah. size genome and open reading. Yeah, form. I mean, the genome's not quite as complete um, just by virtue of the methods, but uh, yeah. Okay. So, so what you have is sequence. You don't have a virus. Is that right? We do not have a culture of this virus. Can you culture the host? The host is currently uncultured. So that's okay. one of the really magical things about the paper. We've figured, you know, gotten this interaction without... Of course, we'd love to have it in culture because then we right. could do the cell biology that needs to be done. Right. But it's still wonderful to discover that interaction. So you don't even, aside from the sequence, you don't actually know what the virus looks like. We don't know what it looks like. Okay. It looks beautiful. <laughs> I'm sure it does. Like every other virus right. on the planet, right? <laughs> They're all beautiful. Um, 
So tell us the most exciting finding from looking at this genome sequence. Well, one that we were really, really excited about was that this virus has three microbial rhodopsins. So these are um, membrane proteins that have an associated chromophore, so a pigment, and uh, they can perform different roles. But what we showed with Japanese collaborators is, is that this rhodopsin is taking light energy from the sun and pumping protons. And what that means is that this, of course, we don't know the actual function in the cell, but what's been shown for a lot of marine bacteria is that that um, proton pump being present in a heterotrophic organism, an organism that doesn't classically use sunlight, um, allows them to survive and, and to, to perform what's called photoheterotrophy. So it's not, they're not going to take CO2 from the atmosphere and fix it into organic material, but they can use carbon sources, other carbon sources. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's been shown to prolong bacterial survival uh, when there's light present, even though it's not a bacterium you would ever say has something to do with sunlight. So now what we're seeing is a predatory protist, a guy that lives by eating other cells, able to use sunlight. I mean, this all has to be shown cell biologically mm. now in the localization, um, but it really changes. So then is this virus changing the lifestyle and trophic mode of, of this predatory protist? And when we go out to the ocean, often people measure pigments and they, they say, oh, this pigment comes from this alga. Well, this virus not only has the rhodopsin, but it has the whole pathway for making the pigment it needs. And that's a product we would normally say, oh, that means this phytoplankton is there. Well, no, actually, it might mean that this virus of a predatory protist is there. So um, pretty fascinating. So yeah. what's your favorite story about why this is happening? You, you must have a favorite story. Mm. It can I, be it can be total bull. That's okay. Total this bull. Is, yeah, I don't twin. do total bull. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see. Curtis. <laughs> oh, Curtis does total bull. Is that right? It, it means that it lines up to the moon. No. <laughs> um, well, I think that we we like to fix organisms into a particular um, definition a particular mode, a way we can think about it, a way we can label it and name it. And we like to do that with humans too. Um, and, I, and I think it's sort of wildly inappropriate. I think biology has so many examples where we're doing that is, is probably the wrong direction to go and later you learn it was just because you had it under some weird condition and really it has nothing to do with that. Um, and there's so many examples of that. So um, the idea that um, this virus, so depending on the, the longevity of the relationship between the virus and the quinoflagellate, um, you know, it could really shift how we're thinking about the movement of carbon in the system. Mm -hmm. And carbon is the name of the game. We like our atmosphere and we're doing all kinds of things to it and understanding how carbon moves in the marine system is really key at this point. So for me, um, it's amazing that this possibility is even out there, yeah. that this, um, virus of a predator is making uh, pigments that are used classically in photosynthesis. Well, and it seems like kind of a two-for-one discovery, raising that possibility. And then as you showed really nicely in your talk yesterday, sort of seeing that uh, metabolic pathway or the, to, to make the retinols, to make the pigments, Crazy. where the host, the coano, has sort of the first two components, but then the virus has the next four. Yeah. And that starts to put a beautiful sort of support to the idea that even though it's just sequence, it's probably connected to its host or to, to the coanoflagellate as a host. Right. Yeah. 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 So the pathway has a component that is in, in many animals in sterile synthesis. That's the beginning steps that are shared, but then it goes on to this beta so the, carotene. The, the host does not have the actual uh, rhodopsin. Yeah. Right? So that's the other amazing thing that it's bringing a totally new function to the right. cell. Now, there are some coanoflagellates that do have rhodopsins, but they're a really different type. I mean, we have rhodopsins, so there's a lot of yeah. different rhodopsin types. Um, and and most of the, a lot of the coanos don't seem to have mm -hmm. any of those rhodopsins. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so this is sort of this totally new function. A lot of the genes we explore in the viral world of horizontal gene transfer sort of have pretty direct connection to genes that are in the host. So they've sort of taken over something. And um, especially in the marine world, there have been some really exciting studies on that, but it is something that host had and they're sort of, and, and in this case, it's something really different. 
And so that, and if you're, that was the one, the Koana we did on. That's right. Yeah. So the, this is light responsive, right? The one that got Nicole King and her crew so excited so was one that was using rhodopsin in that pathway to sense uh, light somehow, potentially through chemotaxis, to undergo this sort of developmental flip yeah. where the multicellular form, the sort of mat of cells, is one orientation where it can swim, and then through rhodox rhodopsin signaling somehow flips that orientation uh, into a feeding form where it's sort of concentrating the prey cells yeah. that it's eating. Yeah, really fascinating collision of different ideas in biology there on a tropical island in the Caribbean. In, yeah. What more can you ask for? I know, not a lot more. <laughs> so the, the other thing I really enjoyed was you looked in existing data sets for these viral rhodopsins. And tell us what you found. So it, you know, so actually there are people in this room who showed a long time ago that there were viral rhodopsins there because there was one known from an alga, uh, algal virus, and, and then by association of those sequences, they could say that these sequences um, were likely mm -hmm. viral. And um, so we went in and looked at sort of the latest big sequence database, which is Terra Oceans, and um, <clears throat> looked at the distribution of the one that we functionally characterize, and it, it tends to be the more abundant one. Um, but then there, the, the other amazing thing, I think, is that we saw there are a lot of new, mot new motifs. I'm sure they're not new at all, mm -hmm. but unknown motifs that suggest there are many other functions that might be going on with these rhodopsins. So sort of a whole new world to think about. Yeah, I like your, your phrase. You say it is a common component of giant viruses in sunlit oceans. I just the sunlit part I like. <laughs> Well, it actually, because we looked in the deep and it's not, it's not common there. down there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's not just trying to be poetic. <laughs> so is this it's actually word count? You can't say in the, you know, in the highlight and surface ocean. You have to shorten it to sunlit. Mm -hmm. Sunlit is good. I like yeah. that. Yeah, it's good. Um, so is this your first? No, I can't say experience with a virus because you've had a lot of infections, I'm sure, like all of us, but just experimentally. I was vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no, we started uh, looking at viruses actually more in the, in the algae that I've mm -hmm. um, worked on for a long time, trying to understand forces of mortality that act on them. And predator, predatory protists were always on my list of things we needed to tackle, um, but... Yeah, this is how we ended up there. Right. Okay, so now you have this giant virus, and there are a lot of things you need to do, there are a lot of cell biology, as you hinted. Yes. Do you want to do all this? Do you want to try and recover the virus itself to do that? So, yeah, about a year ago, I was sort of thinking, well, what, how, where do I go from here? Do we, do we make this a big push in the lab? And I, I think I was hesitating because I'm still in love with photosynthesis. Um, but I think uh, in the last sort of half year, I thought, yeah, we're going to go get that guy into culture and figure out what's really going on here. It, seems, it just seems a little bit too important. Mm -hmm. um, there's a new paper that's shown that rhodopsins might take about the same amount of light energy in the oceans as, as photosynth photosynthetic mm -hmm. um, pigments. So, uh, so would it, hey, maybe it's all the virus, you know? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I would... I, uh, I would want to go out and take a bunch more samples, oh, right? Oh, yes. And see if I could uh, not only reproduce this, but see if I can get some feel for how abundant the Frequency. viruses are. Yeah. Yeah. So we probably have that data by now. We've been working away on, you know, we do these 374 well, 384 well plates. Uh, so same thing, sample water, sort them all out, get single cells and see what's yes. there, right? The, the, the constraint really is that when you move into the single cells, there's this one enzyme you need uh, to, to amplify the material to get enough DNA, and it's kind of expensive. And um, so that's really our main constraint. Wow. I mean, of course, the ship time and all those things are, is expensive too, but... Um, Okay. But so, we are working away on that. And, right. and frequency, actually, the way I got into all this virus stuff was wanting to really get at frequency. Virus, you know, we yeah. do all this lab work, but what's the real frequency of infection out there? And yep. Asaf will tell you more about that. But <laughs> it probably varies from critter to critter. And, um, and so we're working away on that in the background, but we got distracted. So it sounds like you're going to be a future attendee of this meeting. If I get invited. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Anything else, Nels and Rich, before we move on? We're good? I'm good. Yeah. 
Hey, Asaf. Exciting stuff. Now, Asaf, I have to tell you, here on TWIV, we love plaque assays. Mm -mm. So when I saw your paper, which is not just a plaque assay, but a mass spec plaque assay, I said, well, we have to do this. Yeah. We love it. Have you seen the movie of the plaque, uh, the pox virus plaque assay that uh, Greg Smith, right? No, uh, not Jeff, Greg Smith. Jeff Smith. Jeff Smith. Oh, it's a, he did a time lapse of a, he, he put the camera on a single infected cell, time lapse over the next 15 hours, and you can just see the plaque getting bigger. And it's gorgeous. It's the greatest movie ever made. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's talk about your uh, in plaque mass spec. But first, we have to introduce the players. Right, e hux and its virus, Can you and uh, and the one that's uh, responsible for the tell work, which is right there, guy. Uh, Hi, is, uh, <laughs> you're talking about this uh, in the last uh, talk. They put so you on the last day. Yeah, someday you'll be first. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful, by the way. Yeah. It's really cool. E hux. Yeah. So uh, e hux and Milania Huxley. Um, <clears throat> so it's um, bloom forming. Uh, Algae, eukaryotic single cell algae. Uh, very famous, not just for its huge photosynthetic capacity, its massive blooms in the ocean, thousands, thousands of square kilometers. Um, it's also covered by a calcium carbonate shell, chalk, basically. I think it is just so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's it one of the best cells out just there. Just so, so beautiful <laughs> and so weird. And we have to put a picture of this somewhere, Definitely. a link or something, so that. Sure. The, so the people can see it. It's just yeah, amazing. So it belongs to the coccolithophores, which they come in, in amazing 100,000 different shape on a nanoscale. Um, and, but what's still amazing in science is that we don't know why they make this. So every time uh, there's a new hypothesis going out there, you know, anti-grazing or to scatter light or for years, People thought it's antivirus, mm -hmm. and now we know that. Uh, so those plates are made of what? Of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate. Yeah. So, so it, a lot of what's on the sea bottom exactly is right. carcasses, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they are hugely important when the, when these massive blooms lies due to viruses and other factors. Um, there's export of organic carbon, but also inorganic. Mm -hmm. So every cell let's say a uh, hundred uh, disc of this uh, uh, made by this calcium carbon. So suddenly it becomes um, a chalk that sediment and you can see it beautifully. So it has unique optic properties because it's catalyzed. So if you use a microscope, polarized microscope or a flow cytometry, mm. it will scatter light different than all other phytoplankton. And if you look from space, you can, you can see the you blooms see from space. You see right. the blooms from space, which is amazing. But typically when you see the reflection because of the scattering, it's a kind of a post-mortem already. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, so a combination or a ratio between the scattering and the actual chlorophyll can give you... And we even have uh, that collaboration with uh, a guy who study cloud physics in our institute, Ilan Koren, close friend. We actually, we use these properties to look at host virus interaction from space for the first time. Mm -hmm. I know, oh. uh, which is uh, kind of <laughs> wild. Great. Yep. Um, but um, yeah, so it's very super important for the carbon cycling and mm -hmm. export to the deep ocean. And one of the big question is whether viruses that infecting the bloom and causing the lysis, would that push stronger the export down? downwards mm -hmm. or other way around because when cells are infected they also produce some sticky molecules sugars it's called tep it's a polysaccharide basically mm -hmm. that make the cells aggregate so it's not anymore a sinking of a single cell but mm -hmm. a bunch of cells uh, together um, so that's very interesting and uh, working with others, uh, other labs like with Kay Beidel, Ben Van Moy and others, we went to the North Atlantic several years ago, putting a sediment traps and different depths uh, during Emiliani Huxley bloom, be able to quantify the export of the particle as a function of viral infection. Mm -hmm. um, so that's Emiliania. The, the virus 
is super unique for it's the only virus to date to have uh, genes for biosynthetic pathway for unique class of lipids, sphingolipids. Every eukaryotic cells, including us, you know, very important in neurodegenerate diseases and so on. Uh, HIV uh, involve uh, sphingolipid metabolism, hepatitis C. None of them, none of mm -hmm. the known viruses to date, uh, will contain the biosynthetic pathway. So like sphingosine would be a sphingolipid, is that right? So sphingosine is in the pathway. The product of, of the initial de novo pathway is ceramide. That's the molecule. Okay. Um, it's very important structurally. So in the cell membrane, there are lipid rafts, mm -hmm. which are enriched with uh, glycosphingolipids. That's where many pathogens and viruses get into the cell or bud out. Um, but what's amazing about uh, the uh, Emiliani Huxley virus uh, sphingolipid biosynthetic genes is that once it's infecting, mm -hmm. it is using these genes as enzyme, as a platform, using substrate from the host to generate new novel sphingolipid, viral derived sphingolipid, mm -hmm. which they are very, very different from the host one. Mm -hmm. And, and it's also, it's used, also really different. For, so for those cases you mentioned with HIV or hepatitis C, these tiny little viruses exactly. that might manipulate it but can't really carry that. So, and how, how big is the EHUX virus in the giant virus world here? So we started big and strong <laughs> and we were second, I think. <laughs> and that was, I don't now know, 10 small. years ago. And now we're in the lower end yeah. of uh, half a megabase around, yeah. um, around 500 genes. Um, but when we start to characterize these genes and how different they are from the host one, mm -hmm. biochemically, starting with the first enzyme, uh, SPT it's called, uh, serine palmitoe coe, uh, to ask the basic question of how the virus during infection will work orthogonal to the host metabolism. You know, they, 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 it's compete, competing. And why they also the virus needs a complete pathway? The first answer is because the virion contain at least two internal membranes that are highly enriched in the unique viral sphingolipid, glycosphingolipids. The second, ceramide and other molecules in all eukaryotic system are important signaling molecule for induction of host uh, program cell death, apoptosis, immunity, and other processes. So we dive in into this by, and that's, you asked about the plaque, we're getting there. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> but a, a major effort in the beginning was really to establish a lipid profile, lipidomics, what's called, to be able to see what are the unique lipids that are synthesized mm -hmm. during infection. And, um, and just to continue of one of the comments uh, by Alex, um, <clears throat> so we all isolating lytic viruses from the ocean, which is a huge bias because there are many others, but that's the way to isolate. But instead of just looking at them as mortality agent, in a way, because many of them contain metabolic genes, we look at it in the lab as expanding the host metabolic yeah. capacity and not just, you know, not just there to kill. So you, you do have a culture system for these, right? Yeah, you can so that's, the, uh, that's the, the strength about this, that for years, starting with Willie Wilson, Kay Beidel, many other labs, uh, and now with us in the last 10 years, uh, it's a rigorous uh, host virus system in the lab. We have dozens of strain and different susceptibility to the virus. And so how long is the replicative, uh, replicative cycle? of the virus. Yes. So the, the culture will clear within three days, but we have different Emiliani Huxley virus that can kill within two days, four days, six days, and even two weeks. So we're using this as a comparative, and we have Yak strain that are completely resistant to start to learn about the essential genes for virulence of the virus and from the other end, defense from the host. Is it your sense that in the ocean, this is strictly a lytic infection, so it's, a, it's an acute thing that is over in a few days? So, yes, a few interesting things. So it is a lytic uh, virus, and, and very interestingly, and that's observation we see, you can look from space, you can look at plaque dynamic, you can look at one liter flask, and you can look at, you know, one cube 
of, of this interaction. It's almost scale independent. It takes a good three days, four days, and even to crash almost in a synchronized manner uh, the host, which is extremely interesting. It's a burst size of around a thousand and every cycle, you know, three orders of magnitude. Uh, but I think we are super biased to think it's only lytic. And what I showed today, uh, which is still completely unpublished, is that once now we can quantify infection within single cell, we see that actually budding without killing the host is the first phase. And that happened way before uh, the induction of host program cell death. So when you're occurred. forming these plaques, it's sort of a population level effect. And, yeah. But what you're describing is actually bringing that all the way down to single cell analysis to uncover the variation in this. But it seems like, so when most virologists have a placking virus, they'll very quickly start taking videos of it, like Jeff Smith did, or they'll use that to just count how many viruses do I have infectious, based on a infectious, infectious based on a dilution series. But, exactly. But you ended up doing something pretty unusual with your plaques, at least from the paper that we're talking about, and in, the, in your talk. Yeah, and well. actually the background story is pretty funny, so maybe I'll... Before you do that, let me ask you one more thing. May I? Yeah, yes, sure, you're running the show. Yeah. <laughs> so this is something that's come up in this meeting multiple times. All these viruses are floating around in the ocean, how they find their hosts. And I would say they, fi they find them delightful, of course, but they have to find them, <laughs> actually. So when a bloom is finished, there are virus particles left. So how, how long do they last? If you just take ocean water from anywhere, do you find this virus at very low concentration? That, that's, that's a great question, uh, that only when you go out to a bloom, you, you start to realize, because maybe you will have it once a year, maybe twice a year at most, but as, as the virus that highly specialized on a bloom-forming algae, and mm -hmm. will not kill any other algae around this room here, and <laughs> it's a big deal, because a, a typical decay rate in, in the ocean, in the sunlit, that's the term? Sunlight. Sunlight yeah. Ocean. Uh, is about a day, half, half time of a virus. So you have to hang somewhere for like eight, eight months and, and survive. And, and, and for this now, we're thinking about different strategy where the virus mm -hmm. can survive. Wouldn't you rather be in the cell with all the cells, host the DNA repair mechanisms running for you? <laughs> but if you are killed or lytic, or that, then it's a kind of a dead end. Um, well, maybe you just have to make peace. <laughs> exactly. Coexisting, budding and low level. That's what and, I said. I mean, I have no data behind it. So we were suggesting now... You said I could, you know... Yeah, fine. Yeah, right. It's fine. Suggesting now at least four different scenarios. One, we found that they hide in the zooplankton, on the, in the grazing of, of the algae. We went to the North Atlantic, we, con we collected uh, many individual of the zooplankton. Uh, actually, we did it as a new way to concentrate new virus and isolate them. Um, and it's together with Miguel Frada, a, a former postdoc in my lab. Uh, and we had a QPCR a PCR on the boat, and every time we took individual zooplankton from the bloom, it was positive for EHV not HIV, EHV, <laughs> the virus of VX, uh, 80%, 90%, which ah. we were completely surprised. Then we brought it back to the lab, these individuals, crushed them, infectious. You, you throw one into a full tank of culture, mm -hmm. it lies within three days. Then we brought, it's really hard to grow zooplankton in the lab, so we went to the sea again, took zooplankton, we fed them with either EAX or con control EAX or infected EAX, and <clears throat> in their fecal pellet, you see a highly dense viral particles. You don't see the host, which probably dissolves, but the particles are beautiful electron microscopy and they stay infectious. You take again but the fecal... But they sink, right? The fecal pellets sink out of the ocean. Yeah, well. but meanwhile also degrading, uh, so it can be a good way. And also, it's a good way for transmission. Um, mm. Yeah, so they sink, but also, uh, then I heard this phenomena that some of this zooplankton, uh, end of the bloom, will go down to like 400, 500 meters, 
we create this thin biofilm mm -hmm. and, and you know patches and, <clears throat> and will stay there in like neutral buoyancy they have these uh, lipid bodies and, and wait for months until they sense the next year bloom so wow. thinking maybe uh, <laughs> this might be a, a, a cycle yeah. and the other mechanism is, is through extracellular vesicles that we found uh, Two years ago, this is work of Daniela Schatz in the lab, that uh, during infection, there is a massive release of extracellular vesicles. And when you mix vesicles with virient, it's extending the lifetime of the virus. Um, um, but okay, let's that's great. And um, Alex, you have your own idea to answer this, that the infection becomes benign, right? And that lets it persist. Well, I don't even know if it's benign, right? We can have parasites, and it's not necessarily benign, but, yeah, yeah. but it, it works out in the end. Yeah. I don't know. I, it's a possibility, right? Yeah, but of that course. There's a transient that, mutualism, I mean, and then an, how long is transient? The question is, uh, is interesting, and I'm going to ask you, Steve, to answer it with your system when we get to you, okay? Because I think they're, they're all probably different the way it's achieved. I'm sorry, so I interrupted you. We were starting to talk about the background for the plaque, the mass spec plaque assay. Yeah. So you can do a plaque assay with E. Yeah. E that's great. Yeah. They stick to the plastic and make a monolayer. Yes. Yeah, so we mix uh, with soft agar, the algae, wow. with low titer of the virus, and they make uh, beautiful plaques. And is it the same thing as the chlorella virus, where the e hux is actually colored? It's uh, green. Yeah. They so don't need a, to stain them or anything. Yeah. It's uh, right. it's similar. Uh, and when you do imaging, actually, it's red because of the autofluorescent of chlorophyll molecule. So it's nice. So I have to ask you, what is the particle to PFU ratio of your virus on EHUX monolayers? So um, the best one will be around 20% infectious particles. Bad. Uh, and the lowest one will be around 0.1%. And now we do some comparative uh, genomics between the two to see, to try and narrow down for the essential genes for mm. virulence between the very closely related Emiliani Huxley virus. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right, so back to the mass. Why did you develop this mass spec plaque assay? Yeah, so we had the, in the background uh, all uh, the years of work in the lab to quantify. Uh, the lipid remodeling during, that I just mentioned yeah. during viral infection, uh, quantifying the sphingolipids that are produced uniquely during uh, viral infection and other small molecules as well. Uh, but the main issue is, is, is to try to map different infection states into unique metabolic uh, composition. When you do it in bulk, is extremely difficult. Mm. Um, and actually, the thinking, the conceptual thinking uh, between Guy and myself about what the plaque means uh, took us a lot, a lot of uh, thinking, you know. The first thing we did is Guy came to my office, asked uh, a permission to go to his master thesis ceremony in Zurich in uh, ETH, <laughs> where he did his master uh, in a great lab, a uh, Neon Peel lab. <clears throat> where they have this uh, instrument to do uh, this uh, mass spec uh, imaging. Uh, and I said, sure. Um, and uh, funny enough, he took in his pocket plate with plugs to try and do it. He said, yeah, I can and try and do it uh, over there. Um, and he came back with this you know, preliminary data that was just uh, astonishing, just the potential. And then we try to bring in the, the concept uh, before doing it many times in a very thorough manner with high resolution, um, <clears throat> that the plaque itself allows you spatial resolution. It starts from a single cell uh, mm -hmm. infection, right? This is the center of the plaque. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it spread, this is the front. And then for some reason that, you know, even if you check the classical papers from the 40s and 50s and so on in E. coli, we don't really know why the plaque stops. You know, it's under low titer, but why just, you know, doesn't finish the entire plate. Uh, <clears throat> so it's also giving opportunity to define the rare 
resistant cell. We all will, we, when you add the virus, you always have a small fraction of resistant cells. They shift between, they lose the coccolith, the calcium carbonate shell, they make flagella, and they're completely resistant. Um, so also for us, is a way to identify and separate spatially uh, between cells in different states and even maybe resistant, and also to see the bystander cells that get just the communication molecules from the infected cells. Um, <clears throat> plus, one of the mantra between Guy and me thinking about the plaque is that you have a snapshot where you capture the entire dynamic of infection mm. in a single snapshot. It took us a while to, to realize this. Um, and then Guy started uh, with his beautiful uh, work. And you can look at the plaque every time, this is when I give a talk about this, every time you use the different glasses, and when you put this glass, you can see one metabolite. And you see completely different form being produced, meaning that it has a, a completely different spatial distribution of a unique uh, molecule as a function of the viral uh, propagation. Um, depending if it's depleted, depending, uh, we see nice images when it's accumulating, like the sphingolipids, for example. Uh, one of the astonishing uh, images guy produce all the time is when you look at triacylglycerate tags that cells are produced during infection that make these lipid bodies, also a source for the vesicles, we think, that are highly enriched in tags. You see this ring shape, Concent why ring? Concentric, concentric ring. ring shape. Yeah. Why like do you see this? cut through a tree. Then exactly, it's, yeah, like exactly. So it's called a dendro, what's the term for the ring tree? Dendrogram. Dendro... Dendrogram? Dendro... No? Chronology. Yeah. Dendro oh, there we go. Chronology. Yeah. Which I love the term yeah. Yeah. because it's capture the, the history right. of the infection, the, the quick life history of the right. infection. So but, those rings must yeah. be that at different times in the evolution of the plaque, this metabolite is being made. Right? And, and fastly degrade, maybe. Mm. And okay. So we're thinking about journal cycle maybe different light regime, uh, maybe induction of lipases versus the break it down versus the synthesis. Um, you know, wherever we go, this is the first question we get right. because it's extremely interesting. Um, and, and what Guy is trying, so now we have beautiful landscape of the metabolic map of different molecules and so on. The next step was to cluster them together as if you cluster genes or phylogenetic tree, um, but it's not DNA molecule this time, it's, it's faces of the plaque, right? Uh, in order, which is a new way, completely new way, to identify new bioactive molecules that are essential in host virus interaction. And then the guy find completely new set of molecules uh, with odd fatty acid based uh, lipids. <coughs> and then, um, what we try now, so you have the, chem the metabolic map or the, the chemotype, what we call, which what we love again to discuss is, is how the chemistry or the metabolic map reconstruct the biology. Mm -hmm. This is what really intriguing us. A and the next step now is to be able with micro manipulator and so on, to actually um, <clears throat> sample in high resolution the plaque itself and to give a meaning to the metabolic map with the phenotype. So isolate, see if they are resistant, expose them again to the virus, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So quantify, uh, which guy already started doing, quantify viral abundance. Um, so when you're doing that clustering, you had that in, with those concentric rings, is that like a unique pattern or are there many that fall into that cluster? Is it just- There are several molecules- That have that similar- yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sim, a few other tag, mm -hmm. tags, but also other unknown molecules that Guy uh, discovered. Yeah, very cool. So it, could this in principle be used for any virus that forms a plaque? I, I think it can be. Yeah. I wish ours did. <laughs> Might be really useful. You know, even with uh, bacteria, pathogen, and sure. that phage kill, phage kill them, it can be a great potential for, you know, biomedical. Uh, so the, the we are ecologists, we're not practical. The mass spec you're doing is looking at small molecules, right? 
I mean, does it have potential to look at proteins or stuff bigger? Yeah, so with mass spec uh, imaging, uh, especially with what's called MALDI, you can use different matrix in order to detect different type of molecules. Right. Uh, you can detect peptides, yeah. the only thing, and, and other small molecules, signaling molecule, and so on. But the only thing is that lipids are overwhelming the sample mm -hmm. because of high abundance. But there are ways also to get rid of them, which they mask uh, other molecules. What Guy is doing now in culture is also uh, exometabolomics, so to see which molecules are secreted mm -hmm. as part of communication within viral infection, uh, both in the lab and, uh, and in the field, <clears throat> together with another postdoc in the lab. Uh, so are you measuring on a cell Connie. per cell basis in the plaque, or is it bigger than a cell? Or is Say it again, please. When you do the mass spec on yeah. the plaque, are you, what's the resolution, a cell? Yeah, uh, no. It's, it's more than a cell. It's more than a cell. A few cells, five or six or ten, something? Yeah, so it depends on the instrument. Okay. And now we're just increasing, you know, the technology. It can go up to a few tens of uh, micron in resolution. Mm -hmm. um, so it's population. And, and that's another thing uh, we like to think about, which is kind of the phycosphere. Phyco is algae. So it's not just the single cell, but also the metabolic uh, microenvironment around the cell, which in a way, <clears throat> the work of Guy en enable us to, to start to quantify it. Mm. Got it. I think the, the real, I mean, for your system, it's great, but I think for all the other viruses out there, there are lots of animal viruses that plaque beautifully. This would be amazing to see what's different. So hopefully people will do that. What would happen if you took all the e hucks out of the oceans? Oh, that's a big deal. Would be a problem? <laughs> My algae would be happy. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, in terms of, of course, uh, CO2 fixation, <laughs> we're in trouble. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I well, there's mean, a I'm, lot of algae yeah. out there. Just because of uh, numbers and biomass, I'm sure if there will be alternative and, you know, people talk a lot about ocean uh, acidification and because they are sensitive, but I'm not part of this. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you can check uh, science in nature, you'll, you'll get the opposite uh, mm -hmm. uh, results yes. depending on the journal. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> but um, it's a big uh, issue for sure. Does climate change have a, uh, a big role to play on the... Uh, the sort of the this ecology and this organism is it going to uh, change its ecology because of climate change? Yeah, so there's actually a very interesting uh, report that saying that there's a kind of a front now moving towards the poles of the limits or the biogeography okay. of these blooms okay. as a function of climate change, okay. change in temperature. Uh, in different from other algae, like diatoms that like very turbulent and uh, nitrate-rich water, they like a much more stratified uh, water, highlight the advantage and the low phosphorus and, and iron, uh, Emiliani Huxley. So all of this will change uh, in terms of composition and biogeography. All right, so can we move on, gentlemen? Yeah. Yes. Exciting okay. stuff. Sure. Yep. It's great. I mean, uh, you can't, coanos and Plaque assays, two for, or two for two. two for Pressure's doing. on, Steve. And, and now we have brown tides. <laughs> I, I can finish the beer now. <laughs> <laughs> I might need it. <laughs> so um, we want to, I want to talk about your um, organism. Um, in one of your papers, you said the viral activity in the oceans turns over 150 gigatons of carbon a year. This is for the listeners. 150 gigatons. Yeah, that sounds like an estimate out of a Curtis Subtle paper from about 2005. <laughs> <laughs> Curtis is noticeably absent now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so back, if we, if we can go get into the Wayback Machine, um, when I was a postdoc with Curtis, I was very interested in biogeochemistry. Um, and this was, um, I'm, I'm a little bit older than my, my friends up here. So this was back when <laughs> people were still really excited about isolating viruses and identifying the types of viruses were that, that were there. And I was kind of a member of the first wave of what might viruses be doing. And so we would make all kinds of estimates and mm -hmm. um, would draw on notepads and envelopes and whatever I could find and make models like that. So 
Um, we published a paper around 1999 in Bioscience, Curtis and I, where we talked about something called the viral shunt. Um, because I had been drawing these models where cells would lyse and release carbon, and mm. that would stop carbon from going up the food web, the sort of classical food web of, of uh, a f photosynthetic organism to some sort of grazer up eventually to fish. Um, and so uh, in one of the subsequent recalculations of that information, I think, is where that 150 gigatons came from. Okay. That's a lot of... And that's from viral activity. That is an estimate from the lysis of phytoplankton um, by viral activity, and I believe that's from Subtle 2005. Right. And I, so it's interesting, you called it a shunt, and in your paper, Alex, you said viruses short-circuit the classical flow of carbon. So that's another word, short-circuit. I kind of like that one, too, because it makes it clear that you're bypassing what normally would happen. So you're very interested in uh, an organism and its virus, and the cool thing about this is that um, it, there's an oral bacterium that everyone says it's calls AA because the name is too hard to produce. Are you familiar with that one? Um, I'm familiar with it. I don't know its Actinomycetum name. Actinomycetum something yeah. comatans. Um, but yours is an AA also. Oreococcus anaphagefrens. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Tell Ten us times fast. Yeah. Ten times fast? No, maybe later. <laughs> um, Oreococcus anaphagefrens. It's a pelagophyte, so it's a single cell organism. There's four, uh, four genera in the family, I believe, still looking for confirmation. No, there's of, more. There's more now. There's more now? Yeah. Um, well, they're all uncultured, except yeah. a few. Um, but yeah, the interesting thing about pelagophytes, um, uh, Oreococcus, at least, the one that I work on, is they are relatively recently described compared to some of the other algae. So this one is described in 1988 in a paper from some isolates in 1985. Uh, and some of the early descriptions talked about the pigments that were in this. And the fact that this organism didn't seem to fit in with your classical um, algae that would bloom in the coast. It had pigments that were more consistent with something that would grow in the deep chlorophyll max in the open ocean. Um, but it had become a problem in New York um, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, and people were studying it up there, trying to understand why it was beginning to bloom, um, looking at nutrient dynamics. Uh, we learned from genomic sequencing that it was very tolerant to things that might be toxic to other algae, heavy metals, stuff like that. And then somewhere around the year 2001, I was at a conference giving a talk on viruses. I was doing a lot of work on cyanophage then. And a um, person I'd known for years and, and still know very well, Chris Gobler, gave a talk on brown tide. And he grabbed me right after and said, we need to go talk. We need to go have a beer and, and talk about this because we think there's a virus story in the brown tides. Mm. And he showed me a picture um, from the, the Seabirth paper, which I showed in my talk today, flash by. And right in the back of the very initial description of this alga is a series of plates. Um, Plates is an old word for photos, sorry. <laughs> um, and um, of, of infected cells in nature. So. Because um, they used to be plates. Right, they used to actually be plates. Glass yeah. plates, yeah. So. Yeah, you showed that today, the clear virus particles. So AA causes these brown tides in the uh, uh, Atlantic coast of the U.S. and yeah, elsewhere. Yeah, so Oreococcus, it'll bloom to 10 to the 9 cells per liter, which wow. is crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's like E. coli grows in some labs and turns the water completely brown, um, cuts off life to benthic eelgrasses and stuff like that. Um, it uh, chokes out f uh, fish nurseries. Um, it's, it's hard on bivalve populations. There have been some arguments in the literature it may produce compounds that are even toxic to some of those cell types. Um, the numbers that I keep seeing are about $50 million a year in, in changes and in the economy. Th these blooms uh, uh, are a fairly recent phenomenon or have gotten worse recently? What's the story? They are a fairly recent phenomenon if we consider the 1980s, 1990s recent. That's so, recent. Yeah, I, would, I consider that recent. That's recent. <laughs> so, yeah, so they're a very recent phenomenon. They're now, they can be found um, up and down the, the northeastern seaboard. They can be found in China. They can be found in Japan. They can be found off the coast of Africa. And so it's recent there as well. Recent there as well, as far as so we know. So what's, why? Um, don't know. Something's happened. Probably some anthropogenic driver, something we've done to change the conditions in the system that have made it um, either better for Oreococcus to grow or worse for something else to grow and allowed Oreococcus to move in. Okay. 
Uh, there's a lot of people interested in that question, though, and, and right. working on those questions. Okay. These are not as big as the EHUX blooms, right? They're smaller in scale? Um, uh. It's hard to say. I mean, you can still see them from space. You just have to turn your satellite towards the coast. And um, it gets really hard along some of those coastal areas to resolve things. Okay. Now, when people were looking at these blooms, were there, the dynamics suggest that there might be a virus causing them to decline? So I think that the, the dynamics that linked the virus in was some work that Mary Gastrich did that we collaborated on with, with Chris Gobler and Roger Anderson, who's in, in New York, um, looking at visibly infected cells. Mm. So taking samples uh, and then thin sectioning cells and looking for virus particles in them and painstaking work. Um, and Mary went through and did a seasonal survey and she found a point in the season where up to 36% of the algae had visible viral infections going on. Um, the bloom crashed immediately after that. Um, which to us was fairly strong evidence at the time that there was a viral component um, of these blooms. So you decided to look for a virus, right? How did you do that? So um, this would be uh, 2000. There was ha had actually been a paper published in Science in the 1990s talking about a virus um, for this organism. Mm. Um, and, and my colleague Chris had had some success, but he wasn't really trained to do virus work. Um, he did have a nice paper out of it. Um, but we started following what they had done. Um, that science paper, and I mentioned it today, found a phage-like organism. Mm. Um, I'm, oops. I don't want to, yeah, oops. Uh, I don't want to say they're wrong, but I'm not quite willing to believe that paper. Unfortunately, most of the reviewers were very willing to believe it for about five to seven years um, because they had a science paper and, and we didn't. So there was a lot of battling there. But they managed to kill the algae with the phage? The, the algae would die. What we think was happening is they were adding in some <clears throat> sort of agent that killed the algae that caused the contaminating heterotrophic bacteria to take off and grow rapidly, which would increase the contact rates with the contaminating phage were in there, and the phage would take off. Um, we, we commonly see in, in non azenic cultures, if we lice the culture, we get more bacteria yeah, and more bacteria phage. Yeah, they love it. They're so happy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just amazing community dynamic happening in a tube on the bench. So what killed the algae? Uh, in that case? I'm guessing they actually had um, either a virus or a bacterium. Along the way to getting AAV, or Eukokus anaphagefrens virus, we had at least six false starts. Um, where we thought we'd isolated a virus, and it turned out to be a bacterium. Um, so I can't be sure what they had that, that killed the algae. But eventually, by about 2008, Janet Rowe, who was a PhD student in my lab, um, working with some, some good undergrads, was able to uh, isolate the virus, show that it wasn't a bacterium, um, and eventually get some convincing SEM images that we had a virus in the sample. Is this a common issue with giant virology is that you have, since you're working kind of in the same size range as bacteria, that you just keep running yeah. into them and you're, yeah? Yeah, in, a, in our initial isolations, uh, we admitted that in, in that paper, mm. um, that, and a lot of us, I think, were doing it. We were filtering things through 0.2 micron filters, taking the filtrate and screening that, mm. thinking that, you know, phage will go through here no problem. RNA viruses should go through, through here no problem. Not realizing there were all these mm. big viruses out there um, that were being caught on the filter. I think some of the earliest giant viruses <laughs> that were discovered were thought to be bacteria right. for a while. Yeah. Weird looking bacteria. Yeah, that's the name Mimi virus, right? Microbial mimic. Microbial mimic, yeah. So did you, can you culture AA? We can culture AA. We can now do a plaque assay, thanks to my student, Eric Gann. Oh. And so, so it's not nearly as pretty as the softs, and definitely not as pretty as the uh, chlorella virus plaque assays that the Van Etten lab can do, but we can do a passable plaque assay. Is it brown, the, mon the monolayer? <laughs> it's kind of beigey gray. Okay. So, um, but it works. It's, it, 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 yeah. it took Eric a long time to work it out, but for a lot of the reasons, for a lot of the questions you were asking us off, about earlier, we were really interested mm. in being able to do this. What was the source of the virus that you isolated? Where, where did it come from? <sighs> that one came from Quantuck Bay, I think, in New York. Okay, so you took water samples and brought them to the lab, filtered them. Water samples back to the culture. lab, filtered them. I actually think we filtered them through a point two and we got lucky and the virus went through. <laughs> um, the virus is about 190 nanometers in size. Uh -huh. And so it's just the right size to squeeze through. Um, filtered them, lots of tubes of cultures, and then going in every day, screening the growth of tubes of cultures. And then when one would die and the rest would keep growing, you'd go back and watch that one, then refilter it and repropagate it. And 
Mm -hmm. okay. After a couple cycles, you go, hey, maybe I've got something here. So you've got a lot of information about this virus you talked about today. Tell us some of the features. Yeah, we, I've been really lucky to, um, to have collaborators and, and students who are interested in this virus. Um, um, you and I first met at the first uh, giant virus mm -hmm. meeting. Um, when you did a TWIV podcast, and, and Matthias was kind enough to in, invite me. Um, and at that point, we had just got a draft of the genome. Mm -hmm. um, and I had no idea what we were getting ourselves into <laughs> in terms of the giant virus world. So um, we've heard lots of people bragging about how big their virus is. Um, I was coming in here fully knowing I had the smallest of the giant viruses at the time. <laughs> Um, but it's still, um, when we try to define these viruses, it's not necessarily by size mm -hmm. of the particle or size of the genome, um, but it was by phylogeny. So looking at the, the phylogeny of about two thirds of the genes in the virus, um, they would fit with uh, the Mimiviridae group, and about one third of the genes um, of the virus would fit at the time with the Phycodiviridae. We were very confused. I showed up at the first meeting not even knowing what to call my virus, so, or where it fit in on this world. Someone else had named it, right? Right. So we showed up calling it BTV. And in fact, the isolate is named BTV01 that we sequenced. Brown tide virus? Brown tide virus. <laughs> um, and there were some protests at the time because people thought that would confuse them with blue tongue virus. Um, but it turns out my, my colleague, Willie Wilson, who I believe you've had on Twitter before as well, had written in an article somewhere that there's even a virus infecting Oreococcus anaphagefrens and called it AAV. Um, for Oreococcus anaphagefrens virus. So it was published, it was out there, we stuck with it. But that could be confused with AAV. Right. It could be absolutely <laughs> no confused with AAV. Yeah. No. Yeah, had no associated. Right. You're never going to be safe, so you might as well call it. <laughs> yeah, so, but we've owned AAV now, and we're, we're going to stay with it. Okay. Well, you know, you move in different circles, so it's not really a problem. I think you said you have a structure as well? Right. So thanks to our work with, um, with, with River and Asha, who are down at UTEP, um, we now have a, a 9.7 angstrom structure. And that structure has been great because it's allowed us to um, determine how many major capsid proteins there are mm -hmm. in an individual virus. Um, in parallel, working with colleagues at Oak Ridge National Lab, we've been able to determine all the proteins that are packaged in the virus particle. Well, having the structure and having this protein complement, we can actually start to get to proteins per virus. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's pretty powerful because we can then start to say things about what may or may not an individual virus particle be doing or delivering to its host. So and we've also been talking a lot about auxiliary genes or kind of extra genes, these really cool... Uh, Cellular metabolic gene. Yeah, you've got there's what's going on in AAV. It's yeah, got some. Yeah, we didn't we didn't get a, a, a sexy sphingolipid pathway <laughs> or any any light harvesting genes, uh, but we were pretty excited. Um, you know, the original thing that when I would lecture about giant viruses, I would say that these viruses have um, the genetic potential, so sequences for genes that do things that we commonly think of associated with cellular life. Um, so we were early on in the group that had transfer RNAs in the viruses. Um, we have photolyases, and then we have a number of carbohydrate binding and processing genes associated with the virus. And I talked today about one um, which is currently annotated as a pectate lyase. Um, and we, we are interested in this because multiple copies of this protein are actually packaged inside the viral capsid. Um, and we're moving towards now trying to understand how much enzymatic activity there is in, in individual one, um, or if it's functional, which we're hoping it's functional, doesn't make much sense for a virus to go through transcription, translation, and packaging if it's not functional. Mm -hmm. But then to sort of, um, what my lab likes to do, look at things in sort of a global scale um, across the oceans. Um, we heard Alex talk about some similar stuff. You can ask the question, how much carbon could these viruses be processing, um, both in the hosts, um, but as free virus particles? Um, unlike a soft virus, only about 2% of our virus particles come out as infectious. So the other 98% are just particles sitting there waiting to break up in the water column. If they break up in the water column, or, or maybe they're consumed, um, they're going to release that enzyme, that protein. And so what is that pectate lyase doing? What are your ideas? Do you have some? Um, so what we have right now is some uh, global surveys of data where we see that the the virus-borne lyase is maybe up to 20% of what sort of the total lyase pool is in the ocean. Wow. Um, but, but as interesting to me is in looking at the uh, phylogenetic reconstructions 
of these lyases in the ocean, they seem to be all over the place. Um, and when we isolated uh, AAV and sequenced its genome, I kept trying to use the phrase that its genome is a mosaic. It's taken genes kind of from everywhere. And that's, that's a common theme with many of these big viruses. And it seems that even in this family of lyases, the genes are, are coming from everywhere and they're moving around, um, I almost want to say in near real time because things are so confusing um, in terms of the phylogeny and the function with mm -hmm. them and where we find virus genes versus putative host genes. Um, but one thing that, that came out of that, and I believe, now as you asked me earlier, mm -hmm. is there a relationship and in the ocean where we see a lot of host-derived um, uh, carbohydrate lyases, we also see a lot of viral-derived carbohydrate lyases. To me, that says selections going on mm -hmm. and keeping them in the water column. That's pretty exciting, too. If we can move to any sort of metabolism that viruses are doing, either in their host, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in the viracell state, or even by themselves, uh, I think that's the type of question. That's, it's one of the commonalities between the three of us yep. is we're all really trying to get back to things like carbon and nutrient cycles and effects of these viruses on the oceans. So um, uh, the brown tides are a fairly recent uh, phenomenon, but obviously the organism has been around forever uh, and has just somehow learned how to colonize these places and the the samplings of global samplings what's the distribution of this organism do you find it all over the place so distributions of relatives of the organism and when we look at this we're not looking at the whole genome we're usually looking at marker genes okay um we find um members of, of this group around the globe okay. with certain degrees of variation in certain places and uh can you find in the same sorts of samplings, evidence of the virus as well? Yes. Is there always an association yeah. there? Uh, I don't know if the association's that strong. Okay. But. Um, and this is another lytic infection, right? This is another lytic infection, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so how long does it take um, in the lab? 21 to 24 hours uh, in the lab. Really quick. Is there any... Uh, any evidence of any kind of persistence or anything like that? Not, not in this. We have another system in the lab that we work on in freshwaters. It's a cyanobacteriophage system where we have really good environmental markers for lytic versus lysogenic infection. And so what I'd like to do is go ahead and mimic what we've done in that system if we can find the right markers here. But that would depend on there being, uh, I guess we call it a latent state then because it's a eukaryote. Um, and so that we have some ideas about that on how to, to move in that direction. Um, but it's been pretty powerful in fresh water for us so far. Um, so we're hoping to move it into marine systems. So I asked the other two guests about open ocean. How does a virus find its host? So what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, a, a virus finds its host by diffusion in the open ocean. Mm -hmm. um, it finds its host by being um, persistent. Um, in many cases, it probably doesn't find its host. Remember, all you need is one virus to find a host out of an entire burst to keep that population going. So if you have a burst of four or 500 um, virus particles from a cell that you're killing, uh, you can have a pretty low success rate as long as one of those four or 500 finds the next host to keep things mm -hmm. going. Um, in a bloom scenario, like, like Asaf yeah. described, yeah. it happens really fast. It's like the flu sweeping through. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's exactly like flu sweeps. Um, in the open ocean, where you have um, much more dilute populations, um, it's hard to say. So some of these viruses carry photolyases. So we know from work that I did with Curtis as a postdoc years ago that um, you'll accumulate DNA damage in a virus before the particle will break down, and that there are probably populations of particles that are somewhat damaged but can still introduce their nucleic acid into a host. Um, and so we were able to show, working with Curtis and Marcus Weinbauer, that photoreactivation would fix the viral DNA and let it complete the, uh, the infection. That was in phage systems. So we were pretty excited when we actually have seen, and others have shown this now too, photolyases being carried by these giant viruses. Mm. It seems that they're clearly ready to stick it out in nature in a sunlit ocean um, for at least a period of time. So Asaf said that he, he thinks his viruses might be hiding somewhere. Do you think that's the case with yours, or do you think they're always floating around I think both. I think they're probably always floating around. Um, remember when we're talking about brown tides, we're talking like coastal New York and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. I think it's quite possible some of these are ending up down in the sediments yeah. and coming back out in that environment. Um, 
Yeah, I, Keizo that is here uh, showed that uh, he can recover some viruses from sediment mm -hmm. um, and they stay infectious. Yeah. Okay. I, I think it's a greater challenge yeah. for Interesting. Um, the pelagic ocean yeah. where there's four kilometers of water between you and the bottom. Yeah. yeah. But Getting can, back up is hard. You can imagine it gets stirred up and then that could yeah. start something going. But if you just sample relatively shallow water, can you consistently find your virus or is it sometimes there and sometimes not? I, I would say from the amount of sampling we've done, we've been able to find it most of the time in the summer months. Okay. So we published a paper a couple years back um, using a PCR approach looking for a marker in the virus probably three, four years back, and we were able to find it um, throughout the summer and we'll quantify the diversity that was right. associated with it. Right. So as a person who's worked on an, an animal virus, you know, we always, you have an infected host, the virus is there, and then it's gone for acute infections anyway. Right. And then it's in someone else. And so the ocean is a unique, or maybe it's not unique. Maybe it's a similar thing. The viruses go in niches, and then they go, they come out. Uh, so that's why I'm asking yeah. this. You know, remember, there's hundreds of thousands of viruses in every drop of water, mm. uh, we think. Yeah. And we don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. we, we, we all have our own guesses. Um, but it's likely that, that one or two of them might infect Oreococcus or a right. relative one or two might infect EHOX or Coanoflagellate or the relative. Um, there's a lot of effort still going forward into understanding what exactly is in seawater. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We're starting to scratch the surface. We're starting to get deep enough DNA and RNA sequencing, but we're not quite there yet. Right. Well, and Alex, the, you mentioned this Terra project, sort of this global sampling. Are there sort of principles coming out from that yet about the viruses or the is enriched for giant viruses, especially open ocean, or is it still too early to kind of discern patterns from these? I mean, they just had their new cell paper. Yeah, they mapped it um, pole to pole, uh, the virum composition. Oh, I've heard about that. Someone, yeah. But I think you know, yeah. it's a really amazing study in mm -hmm. that it's capturing all these uh, all this diversity, and then one of the things that it lacks for sort of the questions of how does carbon move in the system is that there's sort of sample by opportunity from a sailboat, which is mm. incredible. And at the same time, you don't get any sort of temporal resolution of any part of the system. That's so some of these the... questions you can't really get at mm -hmm. because you, you need to be there, whether it's blowy, stormy winter or summer to figure out what that dynamic really is. I noticed you said we've detected it during summer. Did you sample all winter? Uh, not there. We were yeah, doing that so, in the lakes, but yeah. Know, so, I mean, but it's, it's a real problem. Sampling's hard, and you might go out there and might not be able to deploy your CTD, or the line will snap, and it goes deep in the ocean, and you, there goes your mm. cruise. So. And it's trying to understand sampling on the time scale of biology. Right. So you could go out once a month, every third Monday of the month for a year, and miss everything. Don't miss it, yeah. Um, like, like, like my colleagues here, my lab also goes out in the ocean. We just came back from the Sargasso. We were sampling every four hours around the clock for five and a half days. Mm. Um, and at a point to try to get at dial signatures and how the host community and the virus community change with each other. So this is something that has interested me about having the three of you together. You all do field work uh, in the, on the water. I love the water. I love boats. Okay. How do you feel about this? Is this, I mean, are you just really excited about the field work or is it sometimes like, oh man, I got to go out <laughs> uh, collecting again? I know for me, the first time I went out, I just, it was the most freeing, amazing. I mean, you work so hard. I, I'm, I'm not lying when I said, I, if I say I stayed up 36 hours in a row, it happened. I was way younger. But um, you work so hard, but you're so free. In, like you're only about that science at that moment in time and those experiments and all the other things are gone. And just being out there with no land in sight, you feel so infinitely small that all those cares that sort of weigh on you in real life mm. feel, you just realize you're a blip in the universe, at least for me, and that it's all fine. Of course, then you come back to land and you're like, ah, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I find it incredible. Uh, it's changed a little bit over the years because now there's email all the time. So oh. you're not free. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so for me, at least the proportion lab rat to ocean is still not good enough. So uh, ocean cruises, uh, we do it almost every year, every other year. 
We try to do it more, but uh, it's still a huge event for us. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but continue on your line. Once you're there, you have a month with no cell phones, <laughs> very small email uh, connection at all, no cell phone, not, oh, and you oh, just yeah. totally <laughs> immerse in, in uh, blue water for a month. You cannot get a job like this uh, <laughs> and, and just stay with uh, your people the and, uh, and, and the moment. It's um, mm. totally immersed in nature. I mean, it's super rare. Right. Steve? Yeah, I, I would say most of the same things. Um, I think there have been times when the ocean hasn't been quite as kind. Well, when yeah. I've wondered, why do I do this to myself yeah. still? Yeah. Um, as a principal investigator, it's, it's one of the few times I get to do science with my own hands anymore. No. Um, usually if I'm on campus, and, and we all know this, it's there's too many meetings, classes to teach, people to meet with, the graduate students get to have all the fun in the lab. Um, but on the field, I at least usually get to do a little bit of the work um, and help out with that. But um, there's something really refreshing about rolling out of bed at 4 a.m. and at 4.01, you're standing there at your bench. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> I, I would think that the, the cruises would be both technically and financially challenging. They got to be expensive. Mm -hmm. Do you have several different projects from different labs and stuff on one research vessel? We always yeah. try to maximize and invite as many groups uh -huh. as we can fit because, yeah, the, you have this amazing resource. It might be twenty five thousand or fifty thousand dollars a day, and if you can facilitate someone else's science, I've I've been sort of targeting junior investigators who I know, like if they can get that preliminary data, it'll really help them. So we try to fill out the whole ship. Uh, even though it means trading off on how much we get, but I think it's... And typically, how long is a cruise? A month? Five, five days to two months. I mean... I, yeah, I just did a six-day cruise. I've been out there for 48 days before. Okay. 48 days is a long time to be at sea. Yeah. Especially without email and, and the stuff. Sh <laughs> and the chefs get pretty grumpy usually. Uh-huh. The chef. chefs are... In, uh, most of the boats I've been on are usually They're very amazing. good. They're amazing. Yeah. But once all the vegetables are yeah. gone. But week and all four, the fresh vegetables are gone and the fruit's gone. And, uh, by, 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 by issue, potentially. Yeah. So have any of you ever been to the Southern Ocean? I haven't. Because that's... I, I've been down to the front, but never in the Southern Ocean. Yeah, because it's really... Stormy, yeah. It's, it's uh, bad news down there. Okay. I'm curious at how you s support this research. It's different from what we used to do, or do, uh, which is mostly NIH, and I, I don't think that supports... Well, who supports you, Alex? So NSF has NSF. a fleet, or, you know, you can sort of put in for time on the vessels. Um, I'm lucky in that Ambari has vessels, and mm. you, you have to write a grant to get to use them, but that's a resource. And then um, I think... Most of the Euro a number of the European countries have have some lovely vessels, mm -hmm. and you again you write and ask for time. Yeah, same thing for, with you, Saf. What's uh, beautiful about Israel is that for <laughs> only for science and sport we are part of the European Union. Okay, so um, so we can uh, apply for the European Union grant mm -hmm. and be national with the U.S., Israel, and German Israel. And, and Steve? Yeah, mo mostly the same thing. I think all of us have very diversified support yeah. portfolios. I do have a bit of NIH money. Really? From mm -hmm. an Oceans and Human Health Center. Um, but then mostly NSF, mm -hmm. um, some foundation money, um, and then collaborations with colleagues in Australia and Canada and places like that where we, we cobble it together and we make it work. Well, you know, the, uh, you know, I'm just starting here to appreciate how important the ocean ecology <clears throat> is all right this uh and well you know our planet is misnamed i mean calling it earth is a bit silly so it, uh, do you find there's much appreciation out there for uh how important this uh how important this kind of work is or do you really have to convince people I think some people think we're on vacation uh -huh. when we go out, and I always try to use <laughs> the word deployment or expedition yeah. instead of research uh -huh. cruise, because when the general public hears the word cruise, um, they think <laughs> cocktails on the Lido deck at 2 o'clock. Um, but I, I do think um, people are becoming more 
um, environmentally aware. They realize the oceans are important. Um, every second breath we take probably came from photosynthesis in the ocean. I mean, one of the things I do find interesting is often people ask, well, how can we get the, the oceans to help with the climate situation? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> it would be a lot worse right now if they hadn't been helping for quite a few yeah. years yeah. now. What would you say to someone who wants to start out and do this kind of work that you're doing? What kind of advice would you give them? Make sure you love it. Well, how do you know before you try it, right? Oh, well, yeah, you have to go try. And, and, and I thought you meant continuing on to the whatever we've chosen to do with our careers. Now, it gets to work in an area that you're all in. Um, would you discourage them or would you encourage them? And what, what would you tell them to do besides being passionate and really love it? How could they prepare? You know, I, I tell all the undergrads that, that, that I mentor or talk to that if you think you want to do something, you need to go out and try to do it and you need to do yeah. it right away. It's one thing to sit in a classroom and read about viruses or read about the oceans or read about mm -hmm. evolution or ecology. It's another thing to work in a lab, um, volunteer or take classes that get you in there where you are actually doing the science. Mm -hmm. um, because there are a lot of our jobs, and you guys know this as well, from labs that are a little repetitive and boring. Um, when, when you do 400 plaque assays um, over a day, it's not sometimes the most fun day. Um, and all the prep that's involved and, and the fact that somebody knocked half your plates to the ground and you have to start over and, and, and you guys know. So I, I tell you, you really need to get in there and see if you like that type mm -hmm. of lifestyle. Okay. Are there opportunities to do for undergraduates to do field work in oh, this yeah. situation? Okay. Mm -hmm. I think one of the beautiful thing now about, let's call it marine microbiology, it's, or the new oceanographer, is not, it's not like the old times, uh, there's now a really combination of expertise that mm -hmm. you need, you know, just look at the conference here, mm -hmm. you know, with understanding genomics and bioinformatics and ecology process and, uh, and cell physiology and cell biology and all this, uh, you know, discipline combined. That, that's something it's hard to get in a, an opportunity to establish new model systems. You know, I, I'm in a plant in environmental sciences department. You know, the Arabidopsis model system is a bit saturated. People are looking and seeking for new model systems that have important uh, ecological meaning. Mm. Mm. Uh, and of course, we have all the obstacles. We don't have the suite of genetic tools, which is a huge bottleneck. Uh, people work on it uh, really hard. But, you know, as a young student, to be able to experience all the way from hardcore uh, molecular work and genomics and so on in the lab, to be able to test some of the hypotheses in the in nature, I mean, yeah, can get uh, better. That's exciting, yeah. and that's I mean that was what came through in your talk today, and this and feels like what's ahead kind of across the board is getting closer to testing hypotheses, bringing experimental tools, and going maybe from the model systems to just research systems and to chase after all that diversity around us, and in particular in the incredible giant viruses. Yeah, when we dove in heavy on the molecular tools, the goal was to build these tools, but then also really um, flesh out our hypotheses mm -hmm. um, so that we could go back to the, sort of the stuff that I was trained to do, the very experimental type field work and lab work where we could then test ideas mm -hmm. and ask questions about carbon flow and, and nutrient dynamics. That's uh, in, in 2004, I wrote an article with my postdoc mentor on that we talked about ecosystems biology. And systems biology was just coming around. And, and the idea uh, really is that, so you, you might have this amazing model system in the lab, but you really need to iterate back to the field. And, you, and it needs to go both directions to develop and test the hypotheses. And I think the other big part that um, we all recognize is needed is really a lot of computational um, approaches and modeling, not just in the system's cellular biology side, but we can never measure every part of the ocean. We will never be able to resolve all of these interactions. We have to rely on what computational approaches can tell us. And then we can go back and test them in the field and go back and test it in the lab. Mm -hmm. But it's just this, this idea that to get to global carbon cycle models, we really need to do sort of this ecosystems 
biology, I think. Mm -hmm. What's also very cool about uh, you know the wealth of uh, genomic information from the marine environment now mm. that is really forcing us to go back and open the textbook. I don't think Alex wanted to work on rhodopsy, and I didn't know what sphingolipids are, and the same for pectin lysis. Pectin lysis, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so there's a really interesting process yeah. going on that from the finding, from the isolation, from the geno genome and metagenome information, you're looking for the basic processes and metabolic pathways, and then you get in So um, it's a very... Mm -hmm interesting evolution of the research uh, program. I think that's a great way to wrap up, but I do have two more questions for you. Alex, if you hadn't been a scientist, what would you have done? Oh, well, let's see. I had so many different interests, but I think I would probably work for an NGO trying to figure out ways either to work with um, sustainability in human populations and connection to governmental mm -hmm. instability uh, in, in nations that aren't as wealthy as ours. Okay. Something like that, yeah. maybe? Neat. Asaf, what about you? Uh, good question. <laughs> um, something around uh, aqua therapy <laughs> with uh, children with uh, big issues or old people, uh, okay. but through water. Mm -hmm. With uh, water. Yeah. Got it. Through healing through water. <laughs> I forgot what Kay said. Surfing. <laughs> <laughs> and he might have said surfing. I don't, I don't remember. Yeah. Steve, what about you? I don't think there was another option. I mean, I grew up in a small town on a farm, working construction. My dad owns a construction company. Farmer. <laughs> yeah, I could have been a farmer. I had a truck driving license up until a year ago still mm -hmm. from my youth that I had kept. Um, but I don't think there was any other options ever in my mind. Never wanted to go to med school because I don't like humans that much, <laughs> um, especially when they're, they're, they're not in a great mood. Does your wife know that? Yeah, <laughs> she knows that. <laughs> um, so, but no, I think, I think that science, some, something in science was always kind of on the horizon. Okay. So. Now, Alex, DNA or RNA? You mean, which do I prefer? <laughs> Origins of life. <laughs> I'm going RNA. Mm. Asap. For sure. RNA. Yeah. Steve. I'm going back to what I said today. We do transcriptomics in my lab, not genomics. Because oh, we like to get at Unanimous. activity, wow. not just RNA. for the blueprint. Uh -huh. RNA. Heavy uh -huh. duty. Did I ever ask you? Uh, no, I don't DNA think so. or RNA, Rich? DNA, every time. What? Missing, I can't help myself. You missed half the planet. <laughs> hey, but how about you, Nels? Well, to the first question, I'd love to be the second coming of Julia Child, like a <laughs> celebrity <laughs> chef somehow. That's cool. Yeah. And then DNA. That wow, I'm surprised. No. And what would you do if you weren't a scientist? Theater. Theater. Yeah, in some fashion. Okay. Well, we do theater already, don't yeah. we? <laughs> right. That is uh, TWIV 575, 575 episodes. We do them once a week, so you can do the math. And these... these individuals and others do it with me. I'm really grateful. You can find it at microbe.tv slash twiv. You probably listen on your phone or tablet on a podcast player. We would like you to subscribe to the podcast. It's free. You get every episode and we know how many people are listening. That helps us to raise money. Uh, and uh, if you really like what we do, consider supporting us. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a couple of ways where you could give a dollar or two a month, and that would help us with our expenses. Microbe.tv slash contribute. And as always, questions and comments, go to twiv at microbe.tv. This very special episode at uh, the fourth giant virus meeting in Tegernsee, Germany. My guests, our guests have been Alex Warden. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Asaf Vardy, thanks a lot. And Steve yep. Wilhelm, thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure. Uh, Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. And I want to go on a cruise, so <laughs> oh. sign me up. Okay. Good idea. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I, got, I got nothing but time, and I'm good on a boat. My lab will be grateful. You're sure you'll <laughs> right. work, though. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> How long are you going to do this for, this what? cruise? I don't know. Two months? What are you going to do know. about TWIV? 
Yeah. Um, Satellite phone. Bring yeah, it with there you. you. Go. <laughs> you can come too. <laughs> well, I, 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 actually, um, Steve and I talked about doing uh, some some of this stuff on a cruise, right? At some point, cool. which would yeah. be fun. But I don't want to go for two months. It's, it's a week would be okay. Uh, Nels Eldi is at Cellvolution.org on Twitter. He's L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Yeah, thank you. I'm struck by the scales here in, <laughs> in this fun conversation from microscopically visible viruses out to satellites and seeing these blooms from a global cool. proportion. Really cool. And then one last point, the mosaic viruses, these auxiliary functions, these leaps of evolution that are possible. Really fun to consider that as we glimpse at all this diversity around us. So thanks for including me in the fun here. You bet. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks, Matthias Fisher, for having us. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's great not only to do this, but to participate and learn uh, at this meeting. I want to thank ASV and ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Thank you.